What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Black Belt Business Podcast. I'm your host, Elliot Marshall, and it is my goal with each episode of this podcast to share the stories, strategies, tactics, tools, and resources that will help you establish or grow your martial arts school. The Black Belt Business Podcast is brought to you by Easton Online. You can find all of our digital courses, martial arts curriculums, and resources designed to help you enhance your business at easton.online. So without further ado, let's jump into the episode. Gentlemen, how are you doing? Chilling. I'm doing great. Good. Look at us. Three microphones, <laughs> three cameras, lighting. Better this way. Good to see you all again. Good to have everyone listening. Guys, as always, this is the Black Belt Business Podcast. So um, if you find it helpful, send it to a buddy. Send it to a homie. Uh, and give us a like, give us a comment, give us a share, give us a review. Um, reviews would be great. Reviews would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Reviews would be great. If you gave Is us a review, helpful? that would be great. Yes. We appreciate it. Um, how's it going, Jordan? You've moved up in the world. I have moved up in You've the world. You've moved up yeah. in the world. Yeah, life is good. Life is good. You're no longer a general manager. I'm still a general manager. Yeah, but by the time, <laughs> but by the time but this I'm podcast airs, you might not be. That's true. That's right? true. So I'm so in transition. You're in transition. I'm in transition from uh, general manager of Easton Longmont to martial arts kids program director for all of Easton. How's and that I'm feel? I'm really excited about that. It's... Uh, feels like I'm answering a calling, to be honest, okay. and I'm really, really excited about it. Can you explain that? Yeah, I, I would say that, um, you know, kids was never the thing that I wanted to do. You were scared at first. I was. I was actually right. really scared. Um, I didn't want to do it. I just wanted to hire somebody else. I wanted to focus on adults. And I think it probably took me, I mean, it was definitely after COVID because the, the first two months of the school being open everything completely changed once we had to close down mm -hmm. for three months and then reopen back up. And I would say it was about six months of just trying to figure it out, just trying to figure out how to make it work because I wasn't about to let the school to have, you know, a less than stellar kids program. Mm -hmm. I didn't want any of the programs at the school to be subpar. So I threw myself into it and fell in love with it became really really passionate about it and it has become the thing that uh you know i'd make the joke that everybody's gonna have to fire me before i quit coaching kids um, if i could only choose to do one thing for the rest of my martial arts career as far as teaching goes i would hold on to the kids coaching the kids um, it's one of the most rewarding things i've ever experienced in my life is coaching kids and I think just wanting to do it well and throwing myself into it. And I also think that there was a lot of skills and experiences that I had, like as a, th a theater major, doing children's theater, um, performing for kids back in the day. Like that was actually my first job I had out of college was working for a children's theater. And I did that for about a year. And I think that when you find the intersection of you know all of your skills and experiences something you love to do and something that helps people that has a positive impact that intersection i think is what you could call your calling and when the opportunity when i knew that the opportunity was going to become uh, available it was one of those moments for me that and i've had very very few of them it was one of those moments for me where I felt like I had to do it. I had to throw my name in the hat um, or I wouldn't be honest with myself, I guess. But it took some emotional labor to get myself to a place where I was willing to admit that I wanted the job because I was so my identity uh, has been so entangled as the general manager of Longmont. But I think everybody in their life reaches these places where they have to let go of who they think they are in order to become who they can be. And that was one of those moments for me. God damn, that's gotta be a clip. <laughs> Phipps. We'll, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. We, just, we just kicked it off. Yeah. Who, know, who knows what comes next? Who knows what comes next, but yeah. 
Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. I'm happy for you. Mm -hmm. Me too. Um, and I think the kids program will do better. Because, I hope so. Yeah, I hope because so. you are in charge of it. I, I definitely intend to work very, very hard. This will lead us into our discussion that we're talking about today, these departments, mm -hmm. right? And look, just so that uh, everyone understands how we do it at Easton, right? Um, each individual school has their departments, okay? And those departments are, every school is consisted of uh, front desk or FIS, mm -hmm. jujitsu, and kids, because every school has that. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> some of the schools have striking. Most of the schools have striking. Some don't, okay? So then you'll have a uh, striking department, okay? So we have four, three to four departments, okay? Now, and just you guys tell me if I'm wrong, okay, if, if I mess this up, but I don't think so. Now, there is a department head at each school that is in charge of each department. And then the overall of Easton has these program directors, Jordan's department, where you are in charge of all of the kids' department heads, the martial arts side of it, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. I think it's, I think the way I would frame it is, I think the word director is very key for that position because I think that like the department heads at each school, they're like little mini GMs and to back up a little bit so I can kind of explain what I mean by that, I would say the GM's role at Easton, uh, you know, lead model manage, but primarily there's a lot of accountability there. Like the GM's primary role is to hold everyone accountable to executing the Easton vision and overall he is accountable for maintaining the quality of the product, the operations, so on and so forth. As a school grows, that general manager is gonna take off hats and they're gonna put hats on other people. And for example, I'll use Phipps as an example, like the hat he wears is the Muay Thai department head. So he's like a little mini general manager of that. Can we back up for a yeah, sec? sure. When we open a school, when we open a brand new school, the GM wears almost every department head hat. Every single hat that they can. Right. Mm -hmm. Right, and right. I think every school, depending on what your resources are and what you have available to you might be a little bit different. Like I've always had Phipps, thank God, right. because I don't know anything about Muay Thai or striking. And had I not had Phipps from the very beginning, like he's for a while there, he was just kind of like the de facto DH. Like mm -hmm. I couldn't actually, we couldn't actually afford to pay him to do it. But you know, Phipps is an individual where he sees an opportunity. He takes the opportunity and he crushes mm -hmm. the opportunity. And then, you know, that's how he's elevated himself. I got it. We got to stop right here. on Sure. This because this is such a big point. Yeah. That, like, like what you just said about Phipps. Uh, we were coming out of a pandemic. Mm -hmm. We had no money. Mm -hmm. You were running the media. You were DHing, but not DHing Correct. Longmont. Uh, why, man? Like, like, why? Like, why do this? Because holy shit, uh, we, we couldn't pay you, mm -hmm. you know? And that must, what was, just say fuck it, no. I think there's a lot of instances in a lot of different situations where I would have said that, but um, like even going back to when I started coaching at in Boulder, right? That's where I started. Uh, I remember when Matt Bloss, he's the GM there, he sent out an email to probably like 20 different people and uh, said, hey, I think you'd be a great candidate to coach. Um, we're gonna have these onboarding meetings coming up next week like if you're interested come check it out and i remember going there and there were like 20 people in the meeting and i was like oh there's not enough spots for all of us at the time i had a full-time job um i was going to graduate school full-time and then as part of that i had a part-time job on top of all of it as a teaching assistant so i had zero time a teaching assistant in college yes yeah and that was like a part-time job aside from the full-time job i had outside of school and then school full-time um and I just said, I want this so bad that I just don't care. Like, I don't care that I have all this stuff going on. And obviously like coaching, it, I didn't even know at the time, like what type of compensation you would get, you know? And it starts off as like a half comp on your membership, depending on how many classes you have and then a full comp. But 
I I went for that position without even knowing what that meant. Like what Ty, if there was any payment structure at all with the school I came from, like you weren't getting paid as a coach, you know, you might be getting your membership <laughs> written off. Um, so I'd already like made that, like I had already dedicated like that kind of mindset to Easton. Like, I don't really care that I don't have time. I don't really care that I don't know what type of compensation I'm going to get. I just want to be a part of it. Um, and in the time coaching for me was like a way to give back in a way that I've been given to, um, just like the people who were role models for me. And the reason that I am who I am today was because of, I got lucky with coaches. It was coaches that changed my life. And I was just like, I want to maybe offer that to someone, right. Or hopefully like be able to help help someone at least in this in the slightest way that I've been helped by my coaches and so I took that opportunity and after that it was like um, I remember an Easton online podcast I don't remember who was with um, but you were talking to them and you asked how they got to the position they were in and they said I just said yes I just kept saying yes to everything. Do you want to do this? You want this responsibility? Um, Can you do this? Yes, yes, yes. And that like was as I was starting to coach, I heard that and I was like, okay, I'm just, I'm just going to say yes to everything. And that was like toward the end of 2019 when I heard that. And then we get into 2020, I'm already saying yes to everything. So it it didn't make a difference to me. And like, it was just natural. Like, even though I was in a de facto position, I didn't say like, I need to be getting paid for this work. It's like, yes, of course I'll do this. It was within my capacity. And so, um, that's why I made those decisions at that time. And now you're the director of marketing. Mm-hmm. Right, you're the you're a DH. Mm-hmm. You work here at Easton Online, and man, like it's so it's, it's doing okay for you. This this just saying yes idea. Yeah, and so uh, I think we ha- just have a, like another clip. Just say yes. Yeah, right. Like, Literally, yeah. just just you say know? yes. If it's what you want to do, right? If if there's a if uh, and, and look, you were just a student and teacher at Easton. When you started listening to Easton Online, mm-hmm. is what you just said, right? Absolutely. So if you're one of those people, and uh, you want to work for us, you want to work for your martial arts school because you love it, just say yes. Mm-hmm. Like, like just fucking do it, and don't. And and I guess maybe this sounds like an asshole because I'm the one who pays, who says yes or no to right, like like because it's mine and Amal's name on the check. Don't worry about it. Mm-hmm. Don't worry about it. That's how we all started. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I can remember everyone used to make fun of me because when, when I was teaching karate, my karate instructor to pay me used to go, there was a, a soda machine or a drink machine. He used to go open the damn drink machine and count the fucking quarters the- and hand me $20 in quarters. Wow. Right in front of people. Yeah. My goodness. Yeah, and that's how I got paid. That was, that was my first paid job that the I ever had. Soda Machine Revenue paid you to yeah. teach karate. Yeah. That's hysterical. <laughs> that's hysterical. Everyone made fun of me. Everyone yeah. who knew it made fun of me. They're like, yo. I mean, that's worthy of making fun of in yeah. some capacity. That's funny. Yeah. I think there's a jujitsu analogy here that um, I think is powerful. We talk about this a lot, getting tunnel vision in jujitsu. Mm-hmm. Like, we get so focused on one move. Mm-hmm. And jujitsu works a lot better when you can be a little bit more fluid, when you can take what's given to you and you can react to that. It may still fit within the overall goal, right? Your overall goal may be, I'm going to take the back and I'm going to choke this person. But how you get there may change depending on what is presented to you. And Mm -hmm. I think life is a lot like that in that you can get tunnel vision on one path, one idea, one way to success because I've heard a lot of individuals who want a career with Easton. They want an opportunity, but they don't take the ones that are available to them. Yep. You know, they They say, Oh no, that's not what I want to do. I want to do this. And it's like, well, I hear you and I hope that works out for you, but I don't know. But right now this is available. And I think that, holds true in life just as much as it does for jujitsu and i can say that you know i think phipps did that the being the general manager of of longmont was not what i was seeking you know i was seeking to go straight to the hq team right (laughs) like i did not want to manage people i did not want to deal with the people Mm -hmm. but when it was offered to me i realized well this isn't the path that i envisioned but it's an opportunity to ultimately head where I want to go and then take that a step further 
moving into the kids program director role was never something that I envisioned. Wasn't even on your radar. No, it's just something that happened, you know, but I'm so grateful for the way, way that things have turned out. And it, it's been a valuable life lesson for me, both on and off the mats. So back to this department head stuff. Mm -hmm. What is a department head's job, FIPS? At the most basic level, the department head is a manager. I'm making sure the coaches are adequately trained to do coaching. Um, I'm making sure that if there's issues that they come to me and I, I help them solve it. And I'm also looking for new coaches, training them up and managing schedules, right? Um, probably the hardest part about being a department head, besides the occasional just like weird, you know, human to human situation that will occur is like someone can't cover this day or, you know, someone's job changes and, and they can no longer coach whatever class they've been coaching for the past few months. And if you can't find someone to replace that, like that's your job is to plug that hole, then you also have to be the plug. Um, that's probably the most difficult thing. And otherwise it's just making sure for me, because Longmont was so new that everything that we did, um, we're trying to get to the same level as some of the schools that have been established, like Boulder, like Denver, their Muay Thai program. So also just keeping an eye on the overall level, you know, what do our yellow shirts look like compared to the yellow shirts, the other, right? Uh, the other schools and same all the way up to blue shirt. Are we maintaining the quality that is expected at Easton academies? Um, I think that that is the job of the department head. I think maybe if you start in a bigger school, that's more established, that's kind of already worked its way out and you just have to be like the shepherd. Um, but because Longmont was brand new and this was, you know, I coached the first Muay Thai class, right? Yeah, <laughs> like the yeah. first Muay Thai class in the academy, I was there. Um, just the making first kickboxing class, first too. kickboxing and first yeah. Muay Thai class. And just making sure that um, we are meeting the standard that Easton sets, right? Effective uh, martial arts that uh, are battles tested. That's a good point. There is a difference between... Like you, don't, you can almost have different phases of, of department heads depending on where you're at. Like you made a good point. Like it's like a, a startup versus growth versus sustain phase, mm -hmm. right? To use some business. Sure. The next, the there. next, sorry, go ahead. I <laughs> yeah. You're like, here's the next idea. No. But yeah. So, you know, being a department head at a new school, you're very much involved in growing the program, like scaling the program. Mm -hmm to its sustained phase, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and, and I would say that Longmont is starting to approach with some of its programs, it's starting to max in the current building and the membership oh, count starting to get Oh, there. stop, no. What? Don't tell me this. Oh, because that means we gotta <laughs> knock the wall down and you gotta spend more money on real estate and all this yet. No, I get it, I get it. People hey, ask me every, every day, someone's like, aren't we knocking that wall down soon? Yeah, one, no, I know, soon? everybody, they've been saying that for years and that's my <laughs> fault, because I'm like, yeah, one day we'll get there, but like, it takes a minute, it's a yeah, grind for absolutely. sure. Absolutely. So yeah, there's definitely different phases. If, if you were to become the, the department head of anything in Denver or you know Centennial it's a much or Boulder. Gig. It's different. It's yep. it's more like your job is very much to to execute and maintain accountability. For the there's probably of the more coaches you have to deal with. True. Yep. More schedules Absolutely. you have to deal with. Um, Absolutely. More students who have issues that you have to deal with. Yep. But it's not the growing in the building. It's you're in the sustaining phase. Right. Right. So these department head jobs, like the next department head of Longmont, their experience might be nothing like your experience. Yep. Because right. they won't have to be like, okay, I need to pack these rooms. They'll, they'll I need to keep these rooms packed. Mm -hmm. Right, and, then the, and the same for the next general manager in right. Longmont. Like, I've already spent the last three years scaling to the point where you know I've taken off the department head hat for jujitsu. I've taken it off for kids. I've taken it off for well I never had it on for Muay Thai. You know, the last kind of hat that I'm wearing is is at the front desk. And that'll probably be the next hire. And then we'll have all of those departments covered until we get an academy operations director. And then that will be truly maxed out within the academy. So when you say academy operations director, please explain. So uh I think we have that at 500 members, right? You get an AOD? Yeah, it just depends on the school and right. what's going on. Right around know. there, somewhere yeah, in there. for sure. What is an academy operations director's job? So academy operations director job is to handle all of the administrative work that goes into running the school. 
And there's a lot. There's more than you might think. It seems like most people on the surface, they're, they see the front of house, so to speak. They see the classes. They see the instructors. And they think that's all it is. But there is a copious amount of administrative work that goes into running any business, mm -hmm. whether it's look, you know, looking at your monthly financials, processing suspensions and cancellations. But, that, but the financials right. are not an academy operations director. No, 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 no. But I would right. still consider that. You know. Right. So basically, any school will get to the point where the administrative work can really take away from the GM's ability to uh, be present, maintain accountability, deal with all the people problems, so on and so forth. So I the. The, the place that you want to get to as a general manager is where you have all these positions filled and you're just focused on accountability. Like you are the last line of defense, right? Like if, if something blows up, you got to step in and you got to fill it. Uh, but you have all these safety nets in front of you, right? Like there's not an instructor for kids class. Okay, well, the kids DH. All right, the kids DH is down with COVID. There's no instructors. Okay, where do we fall to? Yeah, maybe it's the GM or right. something like that. And then ideally, you're in a position where you can take on those sort of things because you have delegated all the other hats. You know, it doesn't put you behind on the administrative work when you got to step on the mats. So, you know, and then it also gives you the ability to have more of an elevated perspective, you know, mm -hmm. like instead of having to spend all your time in the back office dealing with failed payments or, uh, you know, responding to member emails, whatever it might be, having parent teacher conferences, like there's all these things that can right. get in the way. Um, you know, there's somebody else to take care of that, but you can be out there, you can be present, you can keep your thumb on the pulse of what's going on, you can peep in on the different programs, you can walk and talk, which is all a very vital and important part of, you know, running any school is you have to be present, you have to keep your thumb on the pulse, you need that bird's eye view of what's going on. And all of these jobs are like getting rid of these hats like we're talking about, mm -hmm. like higher DHs, it really starts to depend on the amount of people in the school. Right, and we have that. Well, you have to have resources to, to pay to do it. Yeah, right. exactly. You know, so uh, I, it's under one hundred and fifty. The GM wears most of the hats, I believe. Yes. Right, and then one hundred and fifty to three hundred, they start slowly hiring uh, DHs, mm -hmm. kids DHs, adult jiu jitsu DHs, front desk DHs, mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. And then at around the five hundred mark, so at the three hundred mark, you have to, you should have all of them. For the most part, at the 500 mark, four to 500 somewhere in there, we start looking at an AOD, and then that that's the end of these program directors, not program directors, these excuse me individual responsibilities in the school. Yeah, and then you just max out your real estate from there, right? You know, and the DH's job, these department heads' job, uh, for example, the front desk, right? Mm -hmm. The front, the the DH of the FIS, they hold the front desk meetings. Yes. Right. So they hold uh, stat, uh, DH to subordinate staff meetings, correct? Mm -hmm. So and they kind of have a, a twofold role, right? Uh, wouldn't you say? Because they, they also have to be in the G uh, the the general manager to the DH meeting, and that's very administrative mm -hmm. things that are going on in the school, doing this, doing that, right? Mm -hmm. And then they have to hold the, the, to the staff meeting. And our, our frontline staff, they don't see our administrative stuff. Like we use Bloom, okay? Our frontline staff doesn't touch Bloom, like the instructors. Yeah, they don't really touch it. If if they do see it, it's just in the meetings that the DHs is right. holding. With but them. they don't have like an email in there and like where they, they don't know how to really yeah. use it. And well, stuff they like might that. get an email or something after, you know, a meeting concludes, a right. meeting summary. But, mm -hmm. you know, they typically don't have assignments or to-dos. They're not using it on a daily basis That's for what I meant work to say, to-dos or, or issues like, yeah, or anything right, like that. Right, so, Totally. Um, so that DH kind of has that dual role of administrator and frontline employee. Yes. What was that like for you, Phipps? Like switching hats like that a little bit. You know what I'm saying? I think you definitely have to be the right type of person for it. Um, I don't love administrative work, but it's also just like... God, it's crazy. I love it. Really? No. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, I was like, that's surprising. I, exactly, I was very surprised. Oh, I don't love administrative work, but it's also not like this uh, huge hill that I have to climb when I do it, right? And then as long as I'm keeping up with it, it's never too much. It's like literally like at the most an hour a week to mm -hmm. to keep everything maintained. Um, what would you say your total DH role job is? Like how many hours? My hourly do, commitment. DHing. That's a great question. And that's that's something that we're still trying to define. Like right. what what falls into that realm? Like when I'm coaching, I'm a coach, but at the same time I'm representing the department. I'm representing the program within uh, within the academy. Um, and it it changes every week. Some weeks there's problems, right? Some weeks coaches have problems. Um, so everyone week, goes down with COVID, you got a exactly. lot of problems. Exactly. Everyone's sick, uh, which we've been dealing with a couple times in the past month and a half. Uh, Jordan, how many times? How many times have I had COVID? Yeah. Five times. Five times. Yeah. Yeah. And then with all the other shit going around right. too, it's like um, with people falling off and then when personal problems pop up, like that's when it feels like it's a, a large time commitment, but it's really only a few hours a week when everything's running smoothly, like right. at the most. Let's talk about pay for the DH. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you, you pay more as they gain skill. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the first thing you give them is the schedule. Like if you're hiring a new DH, right? You're going to handle schedule, two fifty a month, somewhere in there, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Yes, yeah, somewhere in there. And then you you slowly train them to take the rest of the jobs, and then when they're fully trained, depending on the size of the school, I believe, you know, mm -hmm. five to seven hundred sometimes. Kids DHs make more. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because. Because every kid comes with two parents. Right. <laughs> Every kid at least one. The, yeah, at least one. That's true. At yeah, least at one. At least one. And uh, there's just a lot. There's a lot. You got 100 kids in your program. There's at least 200 people you're dealing with. Right. Minimum. 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 Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Minimum. look, it's 5% of the members who are going to create 80% of the work. Right. One, Like 100%, that is true. Like, Most of the members just come in, yeah. use the service, love it, talk about it, rave yeah. about it. But there's there's a lot. I mean, the kids it it takes up a lot of bandwidth, you know. And yep. um, you know, kids are learning and growing, and and something that I've come to realize, like I'm starting to see as I move into this new role, is, and if you have a successful kids program, there's going to be drama within that kids program. Like it's just it's inevitable, right? If you have a successful any program, you have a successful mm -hmm. anything, right? But like then, at least adults. Well, I don't know if I'm. Go ahead. If you're going to agree with me in this know. or not, but at least adults, you, there's a different level of expectation there in their ability to resolve conflicts between themselves, right? Because we can tell adults, like, "Hey, would you please handle this like adults and like, you know, solve this? Use your words, you know, be responsible, mature human beings here." Oh, it's not. You even can't that. tell two ten-year-olds to do that. You have to teach them how to converse with each other and resolve conflicts. I, I, just, I agree with you and disagree with you. I don't sure. think it's the kids that are the problems. You tell the kids how to handle it. You bring them in the office. You sit them down on the mat. The kids handle it fine. It's the goddamn parents. Mm -hmm. True. It's the goddamn parents who are like, why mm -hmm. my kid's perfect? Right. Right? My that kid didn't do it. it. Like, like this yeah. kills me. This kills me. Like, what do you mean mm -hmm. your kid didn't do anything wrong? Like, yeah. I mean, with Simon's basketball story, I think I told you guys, right? Like, mm -hmm. I, I so. look over... And mm -hmm. Simon is hitting this kid upside the fucking head, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like not on, not, like on his own team. Like he, oh my goodness. I just look over. He's like from me to that camera or like, yeah. I'm sorry, Simon, Simon and the kid are like from me to the camera. Simon walks over to him, boom, just cracks him. Whoa. You know, and I go over, I grab him, you know? Yeah. I don't care. I, I just, I, I don't know. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what. Did yeah, that. he didn't hit you. Right. Right. He right. didn't call you the N word because you don't. You're white as shit with blonde. You know, like so. Uh, so no. Oh god, that was funny. You know, yeah. No. Yeah. You know, uh -huh. but you're in trouble. We'll talk about it later. Right. But right now you're in trouble. Yeah, you're right. Uh, I think everybody on this planet is going to be biased to see things their own way. Of course. And I think that absolutely extends to parents and their children 
and uh, they absolutely want to believe that their children is in the right no matter what, and they want to believe that they are in the right no matter what, as we all do. And it takes a lot of awareness and humility to admit the possibility that your interpretation of reality is not accurate. That your kid fucked up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> just, just that, that your kid yes. fucked up. Yes. And, which Precisely. all kids do. All of them. And this is a massive pain in the ass for a kid's DH. Yeah. It's a lot more work. Yeah. And and I think this is important for, you know, even just the other DHs at Easton to understand. Because I know that sometimes it's a point of contention that a kid's DH makes a little bit more. And it's like, yeah, we get it, you know. and But it it's a lot more work. And it's hard to see until you're in the shit. Right. And, but it's there. Right. You know? It's so interesting because... Teaching these people how, teaching the DHs how to have these conversations is so hard. Mm-hmm. Yes. Right? Because yes. normally they're not, uh, let's, when did somebody ask us a couple months, a couple, like a year ago, why don't we have any more black, why don't we have any black, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt females in leadership? Because we have plenty of people on the leadership team that, sure. that are female. Right, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and I want to say, like, God, you guys are just like females, you know, mm-hmm. that, that get black belts mm-hmm. for the most part. Y'all are just smarter than us. <laughs> like, I don't know what to tell you. Like, if you were aware of who we have to pluck <laughs> to be to, to to get them to teach and then grow up, through, you guys get it. You guys get a black belt, like Anna, for example. Yeah, she's gonna get a black belt while getting three, four degrees and a master's. She ain't fucking DHing for us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know? Yeah. She's not DHing for us. She's going to go, like, be a rocket scientist. I don't, I don't know. But she's not going to be a DH. This, there, there's some truth to yeah. this or whatever. You yeah. know, I, now I see where you're going with this. Right? So there's we have, been some like, very talented women who have worked at Easton, and they can make a lot more money in a different industry. Right. Yeah. Like, how old's River? 24. 24. And how long has he been working for you? Um. Well, he's been a coach for a couple years, but right. he just moved into the kids' DH role in at like end of December. Early but he's January. been working for a while, right? Yeah. And I have a friend who he used to teach her at F forty five, so he's like yeah. trying to like piece it together. He's no yeah. rocket scientist, right? Right. And no, that's yeah. okay. He loves jujitsu, and that's who we're yeah. working with. So we have to like teach them, for example, mm-hmm. and we have to teach. Uh, I don't know who we have in Denver. We don't have many young ones in Denver because it's, it's been, mm-hmm. you know, more established, mm-hmm. right? But when Nick Gamez was the DH, he was a 20-year-old kid. Right. You know? And you're like, okay, you have to learn how to talk to a parent mm-hmm. and not get mad when they say this to you. Yeah. And this can be very complicated. How, how do you guys handle teaching your staff that? And no offense, well, look, no, no offense to River or Nick, right? Well, no, They're 20. I'm, I'm about to... Pump up River a yeah. little bit because I would say I think for whatever reason he's probably better at it than I am. Oh damn! I don't really know how he learned, but um, good for him. Th- I was just using the him. example because well, I, I know. He was young. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's the you know it's it's a it's not all young twenty somethings that struggle that's in that sleep capacity, in their mother's basement. But, <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> it's commonly young right. twenty. You know, and I definitely was one of them. Um, You know, I don't know where he learned it. You know, he has a lifetime of experience in martial arts. He grew up doing karate, just kind of like you did. And, you know, he always had to teach for free. There was no pay. So I think for him getting Because it was his dad's school, right? Yeah, it was his dad's school. But his dad worked a full-time job. And I think I'm getting this right. I think he worked another job in addition. I don't know that the school, like, made a bunch of money. It was always uh, a passion thing. A passion project, right. So for him, like, just getting paid anything to teach martial arts That's is cool. the coolest thing ever for him, right? So uh, there's there's a humility there and a gratitude there um, that I think has gone a long way. And I don't know where he learns it. I think that his experience as a kid in martial arts I've seen over and over really allows him to empathize with the kids and him being able to put himself in the kid's shoes I think helps him really talk to the parents you know i've seen him do it over and over again because you know i think it's really easy to make decisions for the kids right and he just told me a few days ago 
you know, we were, we were discussing one of our students, um, you know, doing a fight to win pro match. And he said, he's like, well, you know, I want to make sure that this student feels like it's their decision because I remember being a kid and I remember how frustrating it was for decisions to be made for me. Right now, obviously, there's health and safety issues that, like you know, aren't on the table for the yeah, child. aren't on the table for the kid to decide. Right. Um, but I think a lot of times we forget that we're trying to prepare children for the road, not the road for the children. Mm-hmm. And part Such of a great line. yeah, it is. I love using that because I think it's really meaningful, and I think that we do have to k- teach kids to make choices, and I think that really helps him in the conversations with the parents. Like, I'll be honest, I'm the one who like about loses it on like these a-hole parents sometimes. Like I have been less than skillful in my office from time to time and I'm not proud of it. And it doesn't matter whether or not I think they deserved it. Um, He is, yeah, I think it just might be a temperament thing too. I don't know how you teach it. You know, for me, how I'm personally trying to learn to be more skillful in these conversations is I read a lot, I try and practice. I meditate so I can improve my self-awareness and I can catch myself reacting emotionally and I can speak from a place of empathy and lead with empathy and try and be compassionate uh, when I have these conversations. So I think when it comes to teaching the staff, I would utilize the same resources that I use to to help myself. I was talking to Mike uh, about this, you know, all the shit that comes on everyone's plate every day, especially as a leader. He's like, yeah, that's why you got to meditate and journal and exercise and eat right and sleep. Like you got to do all this shit. You have an hour's worth of Mm -hmm. shit in the morning that you have to do to get yourself ready so that you can then handle all the shit that comes your way. And if you don't do that, then you can't do the leader thing. That's my approach. Yeah, you just can't do the Mm -hmm. leader thing because it's just too much work. There's, it's not. It's massively rewarding when it's rewarding. Yes. But that's few and far between. Yeah. It can be, right? Like most of it is just, right? And then all of a sudden, all those bombs create this massive, I don't know, like big bomb for you when it all works out. You're like, yeah, that was a, right? It's yeah. great. You know, which, which way outweigh all the little thing, the little shit that comes your way. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But it's a lot of work. It's a lot of personal work that you have to be doing. It mm-hmm. is. I'm reading a book right now, and I'm, I'm not very far into it, but it, it's, it's one that Professor Alex recommended for all the program directors. It's called The Elevated Communicator, and I'm really liking it so far. I feel like it was written for me, um, and it, it takes a very interesting approach to communicating. Like So far, the book is primarily focused on self-care taking care of yourself like understanding that when you get stressed and depleted you are not going to be your highest self you are going to communicate poorly and everybody has different communication styles and temperaments and you can take these assessments to realize like this is who I am this is my communication style and this is what I am prone to doing when I am stressed and depleted and sure enough when I read the book I'm like yep that's exactly what I do like I have a tendency to uh, get sanctimonious holier than thou point the fingers at everybody else who's like screwing up you know and not take responsibility for myself um, but I can also and I've experienced this and people will give me feedback when I'm in a state of equanimity and I'm on my jam doing all those things that you just said I can communicate very skillfully And people actually think I'm just so calm, cool, and collected. And, you know, and I'm just like, wow, if you had any idea, the volcano that was bubbling beneath the surface, like you would just run for the hills. Um, So I think that what you just said, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think that has a lot to do with it. I think skillful communication, the ability to have hard uh, conversations comes a lot from our own self-awareness and and to the degree that we take care of ourselves. What are your traits, Phipps, when you're you're communicating poorly? Man, when I'm communicating, I feel like I'm not going to, I'm going to say generally I communicate pretty skillfully. Um, I would agree. I think I'm naturally an introvert. And so especially when I'm like not in a good mental space, I'm in a bad mood, I had a bad day. 
I would prefer not to communicate. Exactly. I would prefer my natural... <laughs> My natural state is I would prefer not to communicate if I don't have to. Like if I if I could get through this day without having to talk to people, that would be great. Now that's not the reality of any of the jobs I work. <laughs> um, it's it's all communication. Uh, but you know, I was not a skillful communicator until like my undergraduate was all focused on communication. Like I got a degree in English. Like it was focused on writing and reading, and then. Um, my minor was in communication and specifically speech communication, like how to speak to people. Uh, and I really think like what I learned through doing all of that, like put me on the path I am today because as a 19, 18, even a 20 year old, I was not a great communicator. It just, I didn't understand how to do it very well. And I was never in a position where I was forced to communicate. Like people would happily do it for me. Like they'd order my food for me. They'd, um, you know, if I had a problem with someone, they would talk to them about it. Uh, so it just took a lot of like growing up. And so, like I said, I would prefer not to communicate, especially when I'm in like not a good mental space. Like it just, if I could just go through the academy, not have to talk to anybody, train, and then leave, that would be great. It's never the case. Um, but I think generally I, I can communicate pretty skillfully. I think that's a testament to your discipline, too, because what I was about to say is I was like, I don't think I've ever seen Phipps communicate That's why I wanted to ask you. But he's definitely seen me communicate unskillfully. We've, and uh, we've even communicated with each other unskillfully. Yeah, it's been bad. <laughs> yeah. but, I, but, but I have seen fips keep to himself right yep. and i think it, but i also think that takes a lot of discipline and a lot of strength it's a, you don't see it that it's way a, it's a for comfort me, for me it would take a lot of discipline and strength like because if i'm having a rough time i want to yell and scream about it mm. i want to talk about it i, I want to let fight. everybody know i want to fight i want to i want to tell everybody why i'm so stressed i want to like and and you know i think that's why I need therapy, mm -hmm. like because I do need to get it out for sure. But, um, but I think that was really accurate what you said. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I'm an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just a fucking asshole when, yeah. when I don't communicate well. That's just I'm a dick, mm -hmm. and I'm a bully, and I'm loud, and and and, and uh, yeah, that that that's all how I. But how this I is roll. this is key though, right? Like, I mean, I, I love that we're we're talking about this because I need to think about this a lot. But you you. If you want to be a skillful communicator, I think where we're all overlapping is you have to know thyself. Like mm -hmm. you have to yep. know your strengths. You have to know your weaknesses. And you know, if we're talking about how do you teach someone, it's like, well, how do you teach them to be self-aware? It's a process. It's it's a lifestyle, right? Yes. Like it's 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 about practicing. It's about having the right practices in place to continually work on it. And I don't think it's a one and done thing. Like you don't achieve nirvana and then tick it off your list and then stop practicing and then you've got it. You it's will, every day. It's every day. You will decay. You will degrade if you don't stay on it. Um, yeah. You have to. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's every day that you have to work on it. It's, it's not a, all right, I'm going to take a month off. And now look. You miss meditating, right? Sometimes. Oh yeah. You miss it, Phipps. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, me too. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You wake up, whatever happens, and you're like, yeah, I'm just going. It happens. Yes. Right. But that doesn't affect the next day. You get back to it. Yeah. Right. You get back to it. So, um, those people looking to be leaders, start working on yourself. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. If you if you're in our organization, Easton, and you want more, like. I think the two takeaways, say yes, work on yourself. Yeah. Those two things work together too. Right. Like the responsibilities that you are taking on at Easton, they will just like slowly grow you like as a human, right. right? Like first it might just be cleaning the mats and then suddenly it's talking to people, either the front desk or as a coach. And then now you're talking to coaches or other front desk people because you're managing them. And like every time you grow a little bit, like with yourself, you're going to grow with Easton too. And like they just, they feed back to each other a little bit. If you don't work at Easton and you're, you're just listening to the podcast, do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yes. If you're listening and you are not in the martial arts business, do the fucking same thing. Mm -hmm. Like yes. this is always the answer. Say yes to every opportunity you can. Mm -hmm. And, and oh, hold on, I'm going to back up on that. If you're young, mm -hmm. say yes to every opportunity that is presented to you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? 
you know, like you did. They're few and far in between. Yeah. Like you need, you need to say yes. yes. Right. We, we are moving up a little bit. We say, mm -hmm. you got to say yes a little less sometimes. Yeah. Right. Unfortunately. Like I say yes less. Yeah. So I, try to say, I still try to do as much as I can. See, that's a question for you too. I, yeah. I'm, so I just finished reading um, Ryan Holiday's newest book, The Discipline is Destiny. Mm -hmm. And I would say that the opening pages of that book are primarily about saying no, keeping the main thing the main thing. So it seems like there is some threshold where you need to say no more often to be successful at what you're doing. Yeah. But it, it may be a matter of... So you're asking me what I do? Well, no, I'm just, I'm like, because we're talking about if you want to move up and be successful, you have to say yes to I the said yes to everything. You have to say yes to everything and... You also have to be open to saying yes to the things that you didn't envision for yourself. For sure. But there is some, and maybe this is like getting into the different phases, startup, growth, and sustain. Maybe when you're in a different phase of your career, professional life, success journey, however you want to talk about it, it's just syntax. There does seem to come a point where you've got to stay focused and you can't say yes to everything yeah. because if you say yes to everything, you're going to be good at nothing. Yeah. And I'm wondering... How do you know where that threshold is, and can you uh, can you think too highly of yourself and say, do it too early? This is what I think. Mm -hmm. You get real good at something first, mm. right? You so get good real they good. Ignore you, right? right? You get real good at something first, first. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then after that, you have two verticals on it. Okay, like for example, me. I'm good at doing the martial art. I'm good at teaching the martial art, right? So that those are, you know, mm -hmm. so martial arts, doing it, teaching it. So now I have two verticals, okay? I say yes to everything in those areas almost. Mm. Got it. Right? I say yes to everything in those areas. Interesting. Okay? And I say, I try my best to say yes to helping people. Now, they might have to do it on my time they might have to show up at three o'clock on tuesday and thursday this is when i'm helping people mm -hmm. for free mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. that that that's my uh yeah there, there seems to have to be like some overarching theme or domain or vision or target that you're aiming at so you know what to say yes to because mm -hmm. I think about like there was this crossroads for me where because I used to be more in Phipps's world in video production. Right. And there was a time where, you know, I had um, gotten laid off from a job. I knew I was burnt out on the video production world there. That wasn't really where I wanted my ultimate end game to be. It wasn't what I wanted to do. And I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do, but I knew it was something within the domain of martial arts. And there was a point there where I had interviewed for a job down in Denver at a digital media firm. And it had gotten to the point where they wanted to call me back in. I knew the job offer was coming because I had a friend who worked there and he was like trying to get me recruited and get me in. And the money was amazing. The financial security was amazing, like the benefits, all these things. And those were all things I didn't have at the time. And it just like, cause there could be an argument to be made that like, well, you say yes to everything. Mm -hmm. But for me, that particular opportunity just felt so wrong. Like I was so conflicted over it. It was like, I can either do this or I can teach fundamentals. I <laughs> and I wanted to teach, even though there was no way I was going to make money doing that. And I ended up doing the very thing that I wanted to get away from to get me by until something else came along. But it was like I had to have some sort of overarching vision that I was reaching. You had to for. know who you were. Yeah, yeah. You had your to value. Know who you are. Yes. Back to that. Yeah. You have to know who you are. I I agree. Like it's it's what do you value, and what you value at any point in time can change. It can shift. Like you mm -hmm. didn't get into video production because you wanted to do martial arts, and it was just there. You got into it because you wanted to, and like 
you know, because from a conversation we had this week, like I'm, I finally got to the threshold where I have to like look at everything I'm doing and mm-hmm. start deciding like what do I value the most. Um, you know, I had to tell Jordan this week, like I don't think I can coach jujitsu for a little while. Like I just don't have time for it with this with everything going on, and that was really hard for me. But <clears throat> in the end, I like had to really sit down and think, what do I value? I love coaching, but I love Easton more. Like I love what I do in my position that I, that I've gotten to. And like, that means I'm going to have to turn down other situ- other opportunities, other in um, Easton still in Easton still. Yeah. Yes. It's the first time I, I had to say no. It's the first yeah. time in Easton that I've had to say no. And it's just, it, if on one hand I was very, I'm still sad about it. Like it sucks. But on the other hand, like I was happy to be at the point where it's like, Oh no, like, I can turn down this opportunity because it'll not only be better for me, but it'll be better for, you know, it'll be better for Easton. It'll be better for what I'm doing. And my values changed over time because I, I think when I first got hired in the other position that I started in, you said that to me, you said, Hey, you, you're probably not gonna be able to coach as much as you're coaching now. And I was like, Oh no, dude, I'll be good. I'll be good. And I was for a while, but eventually it got to the point where it's like, wow, what do I value being able to put my time into more? And right now it's, it's the marketing position. Um, so yeah, it comes down to values, which change over time. And sometimes I think we want to take on all these things. We want to do all these things because it makes us feel good about ourselves. For sure. Like oh, I yeah. know I struggle defining myself worth with like, getting all the praise and accolades for like all the good job I do for all the different things, all the different skills and hats I wear. And I think that, you know, as you become more successful and you become more focused and you become a more skillful leader, it seems like getting out of the way, the things that might hurt your ego a little bit, the things that might sting is actually the way to go. I had to get out of the way of trying to manage. Right. Mm -hmm. I stay in my wheelhouse, right? I stay in my wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. That's it. I teach, I lead, I try to be this figurehead, Uh, try to do well, comp team, Eastern Mm -hmm. Online in this, Mm -hmm. big ideas, big discussions, hard discussions, you know? But as far as like managing people, I can't, I'm I'm just, I wasn't suited for it that well. I get too mad. Same. I get, I get, I get to me. What the fuck do you mean you didn't do it? <laughs> like literally, like what the fuck do yeah. you mean you didn't do it? Right. Fuck off. You know, like yeah. I made that girl come back in to get fired. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. I was like, hey, get back here. She's like, but I'm gone. I'm like, yeah, but your shift isn't over. Shift's over at one. It's twelve forty. But I was done. <laughs> Yeah. Come back. You're fucking fired. Get out of my office. Leave the key. Oh, my God. <laughs> She's like, you called me back in and fired me? I was like, yes, I did. Yeah. But that's, I mean, that was terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. <laughs> not, yeah. not the most skillful. Yeah, it's terrible. Yeah, yeah. 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 You know, felt good in the moment. But I look back on it, I'm like, man, that was stupid. Mm-hmm. But in this other world, I can do it better. So you just, I, I, I think the older you get and the more successful you become... But if you do it right, if you're if you're working on yourself and learning and gr- you know, then you really learn who you are, mm. and you get yeah. really really clear on who you are, what you stand for, what your values are, where you provide value, and what you get something back from. Mm-hmm. Balancing your altruism and your narcissism a little bit, you know, <laughs> and then being able to stick in that wheelhouse. That's what I think. Amen. For sure. All right, guys. Good talk. It's a good place to end it. Yeah, for my sure. My wife's gonna say uh, you're gonna be held hostage again, mm-hmm. right? Because uh, we're gonna eat. Yeah, you know, but I have to cook. But then I'm gonna point out to her that on the calendar invite, it says till eight. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. So yeah. you're ready to be here. Yes. To eight. You know, yes. my, my guys. Just as as we close up the podcast <laughs> here, just so everyone knows what we're talking about. Uh, I love to cook, and we we surround meals around the podcast. Right? We do a podcast. We eat. Mm-hmm. Um, it's cooking right now, but then there's some other things that I have to do to get it going still and, and make a delicious meal. And my wife hates showing up to people's houses and then waiting to eat. <laughs> and I try to tell her, baby, everyone's prepared to wait. Like they're not, they probably had a little snack before they came. They're not like coming here starving at 3.30. And then she's like, you're holding them hostage. And I'm like, I'm not holding them hostage. 
Anyway, <laughs> that's my little rant as we close. We are Guys, willing participants. Willing participants. As always, we thank you so much. If you are looking for some help with your school, okay, hit us up, Easton.online. I'm Fire Marshal 205 on Instagram. You are not on Instagram, are nope. you? No, good for you. Who are you? Mikey Mike underscore Phipps. Mikey Mike. Oh, fuck yeah, Mikey Mark. <laughs> Let's go. Mikey Mike underscore Phipps. Hit up Easton online on Instagram. Hit up anywhere it says Easton. They'll get you to us. If you are looking for some help, we will help you. We have programs to do this, a whole curriculum. So go there. Um, also, if you found this helpful, again, just like the beginning, like, share, and God, we beg you. Leave us a review. Yes. Is it Leave helpful? Us a review. We want to help. Is it helpful? Mm -hmm. If it's not helpful, if it wasn't helpful, if you want something else, you can say that to us too. Please. Um, if you hate, we'll come Dojo Storm. But uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's it, guys. Hope you all enjoy the podcast. We'll see you next time.